Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy to, to be here with you all for the second panel of this conference or workshop on liberalism in, in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, our panel, uh, the second panel that I will be chairing is entitled Gender Perspectives on Illiberalism. Uh, we have three papers, three presenters. Uh, Angela Maria Bojorquez Oviedo. She is from the University of Delaware uh, uh, here in the state here. I mean, we're here. Uh, and uh, she's going to be presenting a paper entitled Framing Gender to Derail Peace organized counterforce of the Colombian campaign against gender ideology. Uh, after the presentation of a paper of Angela, we're gonna have Caitlin Andrews Lee of Ryerson University in Canada. And C Caitlin will be presenting her paper, The Divergent Gender Strategies of Women Leaders in Programmatic Parties and Charismatic Movements. Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner and Michelle Bachelet in comparative perspective. Uh, and finally, we're going to have uh, the presentation of Stephanie Oso of the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. And uh, she's going to be presented a paper entitled Anti Gender Politics and Populism in Peru. Uh, as in the previous panel, uh, I would like to ask the presenter, paper presenter, to keep the presentations at uh, no more than 20 minutes, hopefully 15 minutes, uh, so that we can uh, have sufficient time for uh, discussions and, and commentaries. Uh, this paper will, I mean, this panel, I'm sorry, will run until uh, 15.50, so 4.50 uh, p.m. Uh, and now is uh, 1.45. So if we have about an hour for the papers, we'll have sufficient time for questions and answers. So without further ado, I'd like to give the, 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 the floor and the mic to Angela. Angela, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for organizing this workshop. And thank you for the panelists. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen right now? Yes, perfect. Okay, here we go. Hello, I'm Angela Maria Borges Oviedo, PhD in Political Science and International Relations from the University of Delaware. My paper is called Framing Gender to the Real Peace, the Organized on the Force of the Colombian Campaign Against Gender Ideology. Colombia experienced 52 years of internal armed conflict. In October 2016, Colombians surprised the international community when they voted against the peace plebiscite by a margin of 50.2% to ratify the final peace agreement between the government and the FARC. These peace negotiations were the first to mainstream gender in all areas of a peace agreement. The peace process had a gender subcommittee and the final agreement had a gender chapter. Then, some Christian evangelical leaders and influential right-wing politicians, including former President Álvaro Uribe and Attorney General Alejandro Ordóñez, portrayed gender as an enemy of traditional family roles and biological differences between women and men two months before the plebiscite elections. Gender was considered a populist term that has been transformed into an ideology with basic thoughts, decisions, analysis, and positions of people. Thus, there is still a gap in the information about the role of the Colombian campaign against gender ideology before the plebiscite elections, but we know that these campaigns are gaining power across the world. To start, it is important to consider that in Latin America, ideología de género in Spanish is translated into English as gender ideology. And this research understands campañas en contra la ideología de género in Spanish as campaigns against gender ideology or anti-gender campaigns to be consistent with the literature of this field. Sonia Correa, David Paternot, and Drogan Kuhar argue that gender ideology actually started earlier in Latin America than in Europe. 
However, mass demonstration against gender appear in Latin America in the last years. The Colombian campaign is not an isolated case. These campaigns have also popped up in Brazil, Paraguay, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Costa Rica, Uruguay, Argentina, Mexico, Panama, and Salvador. These campaigns against gender ideology are part of regional and global anti-gender movements. I found that evangelical groups from the United States have an influential role in international missions, offer workshops for pastors and send funds, suggesting the formation of transnational evangelical activism. In Dresden, campaigns against gender ideology are not exclusively religious and have secular actors. Furthermore, the Latin American gender ideology debates are shared by right and left wing groups and political parties. These campaigns are also recognized for disseminating basic but convincing messages WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. For instance, the massive campaign hashtag Con Mis Hijos No Te Metas started in Peru in 2016 and later expanded to Ecuador, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Costa Rica in 2017. Therefore, it is necessary to investigate. How did the Colombian campaign against gender ideology shape the national plebiscite elections debate to the real peace? I contextualize my work in the central debates around gender ideology ideas and the framing aspects of Latin American campaigns. The term gender ideology has been analyzed as a transnational phenomenon that articulates political and cultural horizons since the 90s. And gender is considered a basic basket or a symbolic glue that can be adjusted to conditions of each contest. The term gender ideology is associated with anti-gender campaigns. Gender ideology narratives come from Catholic circles as a response to recognizing reproductive rights in the United Nations rights systems at the 1994 UN Conference in Cairo and the 1995 UN Conference on Women. At the beginning of 1998, the term gender ideology was also disseminated in a test written by the Peruvian bishop Oscar Alzamora Reborel. Then, the dissemination of these campaigns is based on framing, an interpretive schema that simplifies the word by encoding situations and actions in a specific context. These campaigns are centered on networks. For Sydney Tarot, networks are face to face groups and connective structures to interest collective action frames and supportive identities that sustain contention against opponents. Furthermore, social media is a key platform in the configuration against reproductive rights as a moral crusade. Gender ideology messaging includes hashtag activism to intervene in public discourse, such as the hashtag on mis hijos no te metas campaigns. Consequently, the manifestations against gender ideology are forms of political homophobia, which is a state strategy, social movement, and transnational phenomenon powerful enough to structure the experiences of sexual minorities. In the first part of my research, I went to Colombia twice to conduct my field work. In 2018, I conducted preliminary conversations in Bogota with a Christian evangelical pastor and an activist of the campaign against gender ideology. In 2019, I conducted 24 semi-structured interviews in person in Bogota, Medellin, and Ibagué, where the campaign was organized. I interviewed former ministers, senators, religious leaders from the Christian Evangelical and Catholic Church, anti-gender activists, women and LGBTQ non-governmental organizations, and journalists of the most popular Colombian newspapers, El Espectador and El Tiempo. My interviews questions were concerning coalitions, contests, implications, and reactions about the campaign against gender ideology before the plebiscite elections. The second part of my research was focused on archival creation. During my visit to Colombia in 2019, I manually collected and organized letters, PowerPoint presentations, questionnaires, and handwriting notes that I found during my interviews with the right-wing Senator Maria Rosario Guerra, an activist of the campaign against gender ideology. My findings indicate that the right-wing politicians, Christian evangelical pastors, and anti-gender activists identify the articulation of three main Colombian events as a political opportunity that they did not foresee to dispute the inclusion of gender equality in education in the final peace agreement. First, the revision of the education manual for teachers to include gender equality and prevent discrimination and bullying of LGBTQ students. According to anti-gender activists, the Ministry of Education would introduce gender ideology ideas to homosexualize children and deny parents the right to educate them. Second, the ECA survey conducted since 2006 to middle and high school students by the National Administrative Department of Statistics to detect child exploitation and pornography. 
activists against gender ideology consider immoral the sexuality set of questions in the survey. Third, the Nabot campaign, led by former President Alvaro Uribe and Attorney General Alejandro Ordóñez, the most prominent leaders of the Nabot campaign for the peace plebiscite, warned potential borders about what they call the inclusion of gender ideology in education and the peace agreement. At the same time, influential Christian evangelical pastors Eduardo Cañas, Edgar Castaño, leader of Confederación Evangelica de Colombia, Héctor Pardo, and John Milton Rodriguez, pastor, senator, and current presidential candidate of the political party Colombia Justa Libres, joined the No Vote campaign. They argue the inclusion of the gender perspective in the peace agreement would assign certain privilege to the LGBTQ population while lacking attention to the victims of the conflict, women and children. Then, these popular right-wing actors reactivated a pre-existing right-wing national network that responded to moments when they considered traditional social norms are threatened. Furthermore, I found that the right wing network figured out that this information was a powerful tool to spread moral panic and mobilize people against gender. The right wing network took advantage of the National Electoral Council Resolution 1733 that lacked regulation to supervise plebiscite campaigns on social media platforms during the brief campaign. Two months before the plebiscite elections, anti gender activists spread fake images of the education manual and disseminated them as the original document on social media. The right wing leaders were centered on a hybrid communication network that connected them with their followers in cultural spaces, including the schools, streets, Christian evangelical churches, mainstream media news, with digital activism, workshops, and groups on WhatsApp. This hybrid communication network activated what is known as digital militias that disputed anyone seen as an enemy of their social political ideals on WhatsApp. Meanwhile, the spread of frames about gender ideology facilitated the right-wing network to mobilize ideas and protesters across Colombia. Then, gender ideology ideas took the form of a national campaign that organized the protest, Marcha por la Familia, with teachers and parents from private schools against the Ministry of Education in 14 Colombian cities on August 10, 2016. Therefore, activists against gender ideology uses no bowling to contact nationally 100 schools and 30 politicians to explain Colombians' gender ideology repercussions. Finally, more than 4,000 Colombians, parents, and teachers protested, no imposition of gender education on our children, and the discrimination issues is the minister's invention to promote homosexuality. Although anti-gender activists were aware that any peace agreement patients had gender ideology ideas, they knew that Marcha por la Familia would mobilize thoughts between potential plebiscite borders. According to my interviews, this Colombian campaign was an important transnational campaign from right-wing networks in Latin America. This campaign was a repetitive formula that writes the anti-gender movement's wave resisting policies to promote gender equality and inclusion. The campaign was also connected through WhatsApp with international anti-gender movements and similar campaigns, consolidating a restricted transnational elite network of power. For example, activists Edgar Patiño and Catalina Moscoso highlighted they have digital conversations with verified participants with political power of pro-life congresses and organized by campaigns against gender ideology from Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, Chile, Uruguay, Panama, Costa Rica, Spain, and Colombia, such as Fabricio Alvarado, a popular 2018 presidential candidate of Costa Rica, and the Peruvian lawyer Beatriz Mejia, president of Instituto Educavien, that participated in these social media platforms groups against gender ideology. To conclude, my results demonstrate that the Colombian campaign against gender ideology infiltrated national interest in education and politics. The government rejected the revision and publication of the education manual and suspended the ECA survey in 2016. Minister Parodi resigned from her position at the end of the same year. Five years later, there is no news or updates on revising the educational manual in Colombia. The Colombian campaign shares political opportunities that provided anti-gender activists reasons for leading sustained interactions against authorities and institutions. The right-wing network made the most of its momentum to unify narratives, frames, and audiences in virtual and corporeal atmospheres. This Colombian case mirrors Latin American transnational campaigns that benefit privileged sectors with political aspirations to strengthen their leadership and power. Moreover, these campaigns have implicit forms of homophobia and reinforced the exclusion of marginalized communities through WhatsApp groups.
In sum, this campaign against gender ideology jeopardizes human rights protection and the construction of a peaceful society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, and uh, enriching uh, illuminate, illuminative pre pre presentation about a dimension that perhaps uh, when talking about the, the peace process in Colombia, it is not often mentioned or analyzed or you know brought into the table. We tend to see the process uh, in other general terms far more than than in terms of how this uh, campaign, anti-gender campaign, uh, plays such a such an important role in in injecting uh, the campaign with uh, with this uh, paraphernalia of homophobia and anti-gender rhetoric. Thank you very much. We'll have a discussion about it later. So, uh, so we're going to move to to the second uh, presentation now again uh, with about twenty minutes. Uh, uh, Caitlin Andrew Lee of Ryerson University uh, in Canada, uh, the divergent gender strategies of women leader in programmatic parties and charismatic movement, Christina Fernandez de Kirchner uh, and Michelle Bachelet in, uh, um, in comparative perspective. Caitlin, uh, the floor and the mic and the Zoom is yours. Thank you so much, uh, and and thank you to Diego and to Marlene and John and um, for the invitation to participate in this um, very important uh, and exciting workshop. It's a privilege to participate and get all of your your feedback, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and I was aiming for ten to twelve minutes. Uh, I'm going to set my timer, and uh, we'll see uh, how close I can get. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Perfect. Great. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is uh, kind of the very first piece of, of, a, of a larger project uh, that I'm sharing with you today that examines um, gender from a little bit different perspective um, in specifically in the context of uh, charismatic or what others refer to um, commonly as populist and illiberal movements and political contexts. Um, uh, under what conditions women can uh, seek positions of leadership, in particular executive leadership in those movements, and um, what kind of different uh, strategies and tactics they, they employ in order to establish, um, to garner popular support and establish their own legitimacy as leaders of those movements. Um, so here um, I am looking at, in particular at um, how uh, women leaders in these charismatic movements versus a more um, programmatic or um, in the context of this workshop, a more liberal democratic setting, um, uh, how those uh, leaders pre may present themselves uh, to uh, into society uh, in the context of campaigns and administrations in different ways in order to garner that appeal and legitimacy. Um, so in general, um, when people think of an executive leader, um, a leader in general, but especially an executive leader, typically they think of a man. Um, one reason for this is uh, rooted in what is called role congruity theory in gender and politics. And uh, that is that when people think of masculine stereotypes or stereotypes about um, the male gender, those are the same uh, characteristics that uh, are used to describe or understand a leader. So we're thinking strong, assertive, intelligent, and decisive. In contrast, when people think of, um, of women um, or the, the feminine gender role, they tend to think of less than leader-like stereotypes, more supportive and communal roles. So um, emotional, passive, um, even submissive, helpful, gentle, um, you know, serving the community in a different way. Um, so how do uh, we certainly know that um, women have sought to overcome these barriers and seek positions of leadership, but to do so, um, they have to be strategic because basically in short, women tend to be perceived as natural caregivers rather than as natural leaders. Um, so to overcome this perceived incongruence between their assigned gender role and uh, their the, this position of leadership, female leaders and candidates um, strategically cultivate what I call a gender-based performance. 
Uh, that is, they basically try to strike a balance between emphasizing certain masculine stereotypes and certain feminine stereotypes or characteristics um, bundled together in a way that uh, makes them uh, both uh, convince uh, voters and leaders and, and gatekeepers within the party that they are worthy and fit uh, for office. And that also they're not trying to deny their womanhood, which can, um, you know, overdoing it on either one of those dimensions can result in what's called a likability backlash. Um, so people think that they have gone too far, especially on masculine traits. Uh, they're denying their gender role and therefore uh, they look less attractive and likable as candidates. Um, so basically female leaders uh, in, all kinds of con political contexts. So regardless of whether it's programmatic or charismatic or um, <clears throat> tend to try to emphasize a certain bundle of stereotypes when they go on the campaign trail and when they're in office. Now, which stereotypes do they draw on and which ones do they try to de-emphasize? Um, there have been studies that indicate that it might depend on the context. So for example, in in wartime or in a place where terrorist attacks are salient, some scholars have shown that women try to double down on certain masculine um, characteristics such as aggression and, and strength to show that they can defend their countries. Uh, in others where there's political corruption or a scandal that's particularly salient, they might um, actually highlight certain feminine characteristics more such as honesty and integrity and um, marking their gender as different from the vast majority of the political establishment to say they're going to clean up government. Um, so I argue that there is likely a systematic difference in the way in the, the, the strategic bundle of traits that women emphasize when constructing their gender performance um, based on the type of political attachment that voters hold in the context where they're seeking office. So I divide this into two groups uh, that are kind of broadly construed in terms of this conference, in terms of more liberal and illiberal types of political attachment um, that is programmatic and charismatic. So just to kind of narrow in on the research question that I'm posing, that's part of a broader uh, work, how, uh, if at all, do females, uh, leaders, gender-based strategies uh, and performances differ across programmatic and charismatic contexts? And when I say programmatic and charismatic, here, a context, I'm talking about where the majority of political attachments held by voters tend to be one or the other. Certainly you can have a mix of both, but um, you know these are basically I ideal types and the political leader is trying to maximize support by focusing on one type or the other. So in general, independent of gender, um, I argue that in programmatic contexts where voters hold programmatic attachments, they tend to, um, desire a particular type of leader. Um, this type of leader is consistent with what Weber calls rational bureaucratic authority. So the ideal leader is this kind of cool, level-headed statesman who is intelligent, skilled, and experienced, and capable of basically ushering through the complex bureaucracy and all the institutions and the legislature, a certain bundle of policies um, that uh, represent their constituents. So this kind of rational authority, um, and I'm exaggerating to, to make the point here. Um, so the masculine traits uh, that tend to be prioritized for voters here are intelligence, efficiency, decisiveness, experience. There are certain masculine characteristics that may go too far in terms of um, appearing too um, irrational or unhinged, right? So if a leader looks too aggressive, forceful or basically authoritarian, hierarchical, vertical, um, they may uh, be a turnoff to voters. In looking on the feminine dimension here, the green is obviously um, uh, stereotypes that are favorable, red is unfavorable, right? So feminine stereotypes that are actually consistent with programmatic governance include being warm and sociable, right? Um, extroverted, having integrity and honesty, being committed to the rule of law, and, um, and this idea of interdependence. So rather than um, saying, I'm going to do everything myself, we've seen women leaders in, in the United States, for example, and in a lot of uh, studies um, kind of highlight their unique ability as women to work together and to team up with other people in order to get things done. Um, at the same time, women try to often downplay in programmatic settings um, 
too much emotion, right? Uh, to being too sensitive or passive, basically not uh, being able to have the muster to um, deal with the complex and high stakes business of governing. Um, research also shows that physical beauty um, the, in this kind of feminine conceptualization actually uh, makes voters perceive women as um, less serious as, as leaders. And so attractiveness can be seen as a negative, physical attractiveness. Okay, so how do female leaders in these contexts navigate this dimension, like this bundle of traits uh, in order to convince voters that they are worthy of office? I argue that they try to essentially replace uh, male competitors by showing they are even better on those preferred masculine traits and highlighting their natural affinity for these preferred feminine traits while being very careful to de-emphasize the unfavorable feminine traits. So in terms of appearance um, and you know, emotional communication, they're very careful to control and basically have this image of reining it in to be that rational level-headed leader. Um, in contrast, I argue that people uh, desire a very different kind of leader in charismatic context. This is because charismatic attachments are based fundamentally on an emotional attachment, um, of an emotional, direct, unmediated attachment with a leader whom people want to perceive basically as their superhero. So um, this is consistent, of course, with Weber's idea of charismatic authority, where, and I argue, how does this break down in terms of gender characteristics? The leader embraces what I argue to be hyper-masculine or extreme masculine traits to demonstrate their superiority. So not only are they assertive and decisive, but they have unbridled aggression that they're willing to unleash on behalf of the people um, against anybody who uh, threatens to oppose uh, the popular world. They have Herculean strength. They have unparalleled talent. Um, in contrast, they, they don't worry so much about these kind of rational uh, bundle of traits that apply to charismatic contexts, such as experience and efficiency. Um, I put rationality in quotes because it's kind of, um, I don't want to imply that people who support charismatic leaders are irrational. Um, uh, but in any case, these characteristics can actually make a leader look out of touch with the people's true will um, in a charismatic context. Now, what about the role of feminine stereotypes in charismatic movements? I argue that uh, charismatic leaders are hyper-masculine themselves, but they often surround themselves with hyper-feminine women to accentuate their tyrannical image, to exaggerate their um, image of superiority. So women who display those characteristics that programmatic female leaders try to downplay, excessive emotion, sensitivity, submissivist to the charismatic leader in particular, and physical beauty. And so this is a kind of uh, based in the logic of complementarity in gender, uh, in gender studies. So um, by having these traditional stereotypes of gender complement each other, they kind of, uh, the, the feminine side can make the hyper-masculine leader look all the more powerful or tyrannical and can actually intensify citizens' emotional attachments to that leader. So we see this all the time if we look at charismatic leaders, okay? So these are female relatives of these charismatic leaders that they surround themselves with. The leader is hyper-masculine, the, the wife, daughters, uh, depending on the picture here, are hyper-feminine. Now, how do women navigate this arguably trickier context uh, to justify that they too are um, capable of rising as these kind of superheroes? I basically argue that they don't try to do that. They don't try to replace a heroic male leader. Instead, they try to complement a male relative, a charismatic male predecessor whom they are related to and, and position themselves as channeling the hyper-masculine authority of that leader while fulfilling these kind of hyper-feminine uh, traits themselves. Um, so instead of this logic of replacement, we have this logic of complementarity in uh, charismatic movements. So I'm going to, this is largely theory based. I'm just starting to do um, a comparison here. If you look at some charismatic uh, female leaders who have either risen to power or are hopeful to have almost uh, been there, um, they attach themselves to these charismatic male predecessors. Okay, um, so 
I am off it. I have just started my empirical comparison, as you notice, is woefully incomplete in my paper. But basically, looking at um, just starting this project with a comparison of the programmatic Michelle Batalet and the charismatic Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, and in the, the very different ways. And so they're very similar in that they rose to power in neighboring countries, same region, basically the same time frame, both from the left. But they uh, constructed very different gender-based performances. So my first step is kind of a almost a descriptive exercise to document how they strategically crafted their gender-based strategy. And then I hope to, um, in subsequent studies, move to the voter side to see how, um, you know, what it is that they actually look for in, in a leader, um, and, and particularly in a female leader, to see if those kind of expectations um, diverge. I'm going to skip over some examples from my preliminary analysis, uh, but thank you so much, and, and I look forward to your uh, questions and comments. And I will stop sharing my screen. Sorry, just a moment. I gotta find it. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kaylee, for this oh, very interesting presentation. Again, another, you know, new look at a new issue, a new research item in a, a continuously expanding research agenda. Great. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Uh, there'll be many questions, I'm pretty sure. Uh, okay, so let's move on now uh, to the last paper presentation, and that will be by Stephanie Rousseau, and Stephanie, uh, who is uh, who, uh, at the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, uh, Peru, Lima, Lima, Peru. Uh, she will be presenter, presenting uh, a paper entitled Anti-Gender Politics and Populism in Peru. So Stephanie, again, we're here, we're somos todo oído. We're here, we are all Thank ears. Thank Welcome. you, Diego, uh, and I, I thank very much uh, Marlene, um, uh, yourself, Diego, and, and all the organ organizers of this uh, wonderful workshop at, at George Washington University. Um, I uh, will present a paper that uh, has actually been published a couple of months ago. Uh, it's a paper uh, with the same title and, uh, well, more, more or less the same title. Uh, and um, uh, I, I'm, uh, of course, uh, very, very interested in, in your feedback because it's, it's a work that I will uh, continue developing in, in further, uh, further papers. Um, and as I'll mention during my, my presentation, uh, there are some aspects that I wasn't able to uh, dig in for, for that paper that uh, I'll be pursuing uh, later on. So uh, let me share my presentation. Um, okay. I hope that you can see it. Perfect, perfect. Uh, okay, great. Uh, but I should be at the beginning. Okay, so um, this this paper is uh, basically an attempt to um, sort of broaden uh, the uh, scope of um, uh, the analysis on anti-gender politics in Latin America. Um, which uh, basically up to now, I would say, or very recently, uh, was um, referring to uh, the rise of uh, evangelical um, uh, conservative actors in politics as um, one of the main, uh, if not the main uh, factor explaining the uh, growing popularity of, uh, of the uh, anti-gender uh, campaigns. Um, so uh, what I argue in that paper is that um, 
the notion of populism um, is uh, very fruitful uh, to uh, as a frame um, as a framework to understand uh, the strategies of anti-gender actors, but also the uh, their uh, success uh, in uh, becoming sort of uh, common a new common sense in 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 part of a central part of politics in different countries and, and Peru is is a is a, a case that I, I argue is is very very representative of that uh, dynamics. Um, so uh, just just to give you an idea about uh, what I do in the in the paper, uh, part of the paper is actually a discourse analysis of uh, anti-gender actors, uh, both in civil society and uh, as, as political leaders of political parties. Um, so uh, what uh, I show is uh, uh, partly similar to what uh, Angela was uh, explaining in, in reference to the Colombian case. Um, but uh, I'll try to, to cover what, what's maybe uh, complementary or, or different than, than, than what she said. Uh, so basically gender here is uh, at the core of uh, the campaigns as a concept, as a, an issue that is a problem. And this is new in comparison to prior uh, conservative uh, politics uh, or moral conservative politics in Latin America, which of course is not new. Uh, we, we see in, in many countries, if not all uh, conservative actors or religious conservative actors as very important in politics. And especially uh, when it comes to opposing a number of um, uh, policy reforms uh, that have to do basically with, with sexual and reproductive rights. But what is new uh, and, and the reason why uh, we now use the expression anti-gender politi politics is that gender itself is, uh, is problematized uh, and in, is uh, contested. So it is described uh, as a false ideology that threatens the integrity of the family and of the nation. So uh, in, in the discourse analysis that, that I uh, do in the paper actually kind of, kind of uh, supports that, you know, that it's not only the family, uh, but it's also the nation. It's the people, it's the nation that are being threatened by uh, gender ideology, as they say. Um, so in that sense, uh, I also find that gender is part in this discourse as a, uh, is part of a neo-imperialist project to dominate Peru. And but uh, we could probably see that uh, for other cases. Um, so gender is a foreign notion, a foreign idea uh, or, or ideology uh, that is uh, being used uh, by a set of actors, both internationally and nationally, to um, impose a control over society and limit um, uh, its development. Uh, including its economic development. Um, those who defend uh, gender ideology uh, are um, uh, considered to be perverted elites, um, also at the national level, uh, because that um, discourse actually um, uh, coincides with uh, a growing trend in Peruvian politics to uh, delegitimize uh, and, and demonize what are called the uh, caviar um, uh, class, uh, which is uh, not, exactly, not exactly a social class, um, but it's, it's a, a socially progressive, uh, uh, relatively wealthy, but not 
not necessarily wealthy uh, group uh, that is uh, described as, be, as being the promoters of gender ideology and uh, that are um, uh, identified as being responsible for the uh, entrance of gender ideology in the state, in the Peruvian state in the last decades, which has led to a number of reforms um, in, in public policy. So uh, you have the, um, uh, the joint critique of, uh, of gender and also of the uh, group, uh, the uh, elite group in, in political terms or in, in, in public policy terms that uh, supposedly have managed to uh, control the state uh, uh, and exclude the needs and the views of the people, the real Peruvian people. So uh, of course, the what uh, uh, anti-gender politics is calling uh, for uh, as a populist discourse is that the people unite to uh, defend society against this threat. Um, so uh, just to give you a brief idea of uh, the tragic, tragic trajectory, sorry, of that uh, mobilization, um, you can see that my English is quite rusty. <laughs> um, it uh, basically um, builds on some uh, antecedents uh, that, that uh, we can briefly uh, locate between 2006 and 2015, um, and that are linked to an attempt within civil society mostly, uh, and, and within Congress to promote uh, the adoption of same-sex union uh, legislation. Um, but uh, there's a, a, a dividing line uh, that starts in 2016, uh, where we see the uh, appearance of the uh, this focus that I was referring to um, on gender itself, um, gender as a as a concept, as a supposed uh, false ideology. And this coincides with uh, and is in fact um, uh, quite directly uh, caused by the adoption by the Peruvian state, by the Ministry of Education of a new uh, school curricula that is based on an inclusive and constructivist perspective uh, on, um, on gender and on, and on uh, sexual education. Um, so this unleashes a, a very, very massive uh, response by uh, mainly evangelical and Catholic conservative leaders. Uh, but here I want to emphasize that it's not only um, uh, churches, authorities, but also uh, lay people that mobilize uh, and create new campaigns and new forms of uh, collective action, uh, like uh, the protest that you see on the picture, uh, led by the, uh, the, the, the campaign Con Mis Hijos No Te Metas. Uh, you also see uh, uh, a group called Padres en Acción, uh, Parents in Action, that uh, use the judicial um, uh, system uh, the judiciary to try to declare uh, the uh, school curricula unconstitutional um, and as well as other actions. Um, and then almost at the same time, uh, uh, during the second round of the 2016 national elections, you see a very public move by Keiko Fujimori, the leader of Fuerza Popular to uh, uh, ally with um, with uh, these uh, different um, organizations and commit herself to uh, uh, promoting and implementing their agenda. As you know, probably uh, Keiko Fujimori does not win the elections, but her party manages to get a, 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 a really a dominant voice in Congress. In fact, they, they control Congress. And so uh, a, a number of different Congress members um, are uh, become very, very active in um, uh, as uh, spokespersons for uh, 
uh, the anti-gender uh, discourse um, and, and for example, they, they propose uh, bills to outlaw gender as a, a word that can be used uh, within a state official documents. Happily, the, the, the bill was never uh, adopted, uh, but uh, uh, it's just to give you an idea of the, the, the level of, of paranoia or I guess the, the importance uh, that these actors uh, give to uh, uh, struggling against gender. Um, well, Peru, as you probably know, uh, ha has been uh, living through a very, very important uh, political instability since 2017, more or less. Uh, and uh, I, I won't go over the details, but uh, the key important fact that I want to uh, emphasize is that the uh, political instability uh, in a way uh, has been favorable to the progress of uh, anti-gender actors um, in the sense that uh, there were, um, uh, there was a, a new political party that was launched uh, for the 2021 national elections, uh, the party called Renovación Popular, led by uh, Rafael López Aliaga. Um, and this party is actually a, a, a sequel to a, a prior uh, party uh, called the Solidaridad Nacional that, uh, uh, for example, was, was the, the party of uh, Lima's mayor for uh, two different uh, terms. Um, and uh, Rafael López Aliaga uh, manages to get uh, within his uh, list of candidates uh, a number of anti-gender uh, spokespersons, activists, uh, very uh, vocal spokespersons, and he himself is a very, very open uh, in his um, uh, comments and, and remarks uh, condemning uh, gender ideology. And he uh, does not win the election, of course, does not even win the, the first round, but um, uh, ends uh, in third position, very, very uh, close to Keiko Fujimori and relatively close to Pedro Castillo, because as somebody said earlier, there were, um, 18 uh, presidential candidates in the election. So the, 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 the fragmentation of the vote was, was extreme. Um, okay, so um, basically, uh, and to, to sum up uh, the, what I uh, propose in this paper is that, um, of course, as we all know, populism is not dead in Latin America. Uh, it finds a way to uh, revitalize every decade, it's, it seems. And uh, I argue that we are currently in a period where uh, populism is very centrally based on anti-gender politics, um, uh, uh, which has uh, as uh, of course, um, consequence, a main consequence to reify uh, the traditional heteronormative family um, uh, and um, also uh, shows that uh, populism is not only a phenomenon that thrives um, based on the socio-economic exclusion of uh, uh, the majority of the population, but can also thrive uh, on the basis of uh, a cultural gap uh, that uh, has built in some cases, at least in the case of Peru, uh, between uh, popular common sense and uh, the ideas and agendas that uh, different uh, social movements have managed to, um, to um, uh, get into, uh, get accepted by uh, governing elites to some extent, of course, uh, uh, with, with 
all kinds of limits that we could we could discuss. But uh, enough that uh, uh, this reaction, um, uh, which of course uh, exaggerates uh, the impact of the reforms uh, or the the purpose of the reforms that that were adopted by by state policy. Uh, in fact, becomes uh, the real uh, uh, motive for uh, a popular uh, mobilization and the mobiliza mobilization of a new set of uh, political leaders. Um, so basically, this is uh, what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much time we have left. I guess we don't have much time left, so maybe in, in the question. Yeah, if, if you if you want to wrap up, you may have two more or three more minutes. No, oh, it's it's okay. I'll, I'll end oh. here so that we have time for comments. All right. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Stephanie, for this wonderful presentation on anti-gender and populism in Peru. Uh, we have a we had a wow a terrific set of three great presentation, great papers. Uh, two of them uh, dealing with, uh, I would say, maybe new sources of uh, illiberalism in, in Latin America that, as you said, uh, Stephanie, uh, go beyond the traditional link between liberalism or populism and socioeconomic factors. Right? Uh, what we see here is, or, or Authoritarian tendencies on this, on the side of the of the of right wing uh, forces and actors. What we see here is something completely new, uh, uh, the, sort of a the emergence of a, a cultural issues or cultural wars as trigger for political political action and political movement and. Uh, in a, that that play a, a significantly important role in uh, in this uh, drift towards uh, illiberalism that we have seen in Latin America recently. And it, very interestingly, I guess as I said before, the paper of uh, the paper of Angela uh, brought into uh, focus uh, the role that these uh, sources of, of illiberalism play in, in the referendum, uh, the peace, uh, peace process referendum. And then of course, one wonders from a political perspective, you know, to what extent in terms of uh, strategic choices, to what extent is uh, uh, prudent for uh, non-authoritarian, non-populist, non-illiberal forces to open the door for these issues to get into the discussion, thus, you know, a, a becoming a potential sources of polarization, a polarization that doesn't that works obviously in favor of uh, illiberalism and, and against a representative democracy. It's a, it's a question that is more than an academic question. It's, it's a question that you know addresses more the issue of how strategically savvy. Uh, the political uh, elites uh, are in dealing with this. Uh, and um, I also uh, thought it was uh, very interesting, uh, the, the, the discussion of how these networks of anti-gender uh, uh, activism have expanded throughout the, throughout the Americas, uh, in, in Peru, in Colombia, I'm from Paraguay. So I know it very well, how it, how it evolved in, in Paraguay is, is terrible. I mean, it, it was, you know, uh, you know, you were talking about Peru, you were talking about Colombia. And I said, well, <laughs> I can think about, about Paraguay. And I, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, Andrea, but I believe Alejandro Ordonez once uh, went to a plaza and burned some books. Uh, if I'm correct, correct, well, you that, correct. Okay, and in Paraguay, you had the first. In Paraguay, the Ministry of Education did the same. He carried, yeah. I don't know how many books, of, you know, primary books, whatever, that were supposed to be infiltrated by gender ideology, took it to the plaza and burned it. So it is, it is it, it, well, quite, quite a, a frightening, interesting, but frightening at, at the same time. And 
And to, to, just to give you an idea, I mean, uh, the former Archbishop of Asunción, the Metropolitan Archbishop, the, the main uh, uh, leader, religious leader of the Roman Catholic Church in Paraguay, also bl not only blamed the United Nations and the New World Order, Nuevo Orden Mundial, uh, as being behind this, he also opposed radically the esquipulas. Do you know the esquipulas accord, which is something that has to do with climate change, saying that it was infiltrated, the esquipulas uh, accord, it was infiltrated by a gender ideology. And it forced the government who sent the esquipulas accord for ratification to the Congress to withdraw it. Well, hey, that was just an anecdote. And then I found also quite interesting uh, the paper of Caitlin, uh, which deals with something completely different. Uh, I mean, something certainly more refreshing and less frightening than, than what we are discussing in, we were, or you were discussing actually, in the case of uh, anti-gender uh, movement uh, and, and activism. Uh, and the issue of how do women uh, succeed in uh, a, a accessing position, high position of power. And certainly you have chosen two great uh, examples, uh, Cristina, Fernanda de Kirchner and, and Michelle Bachelet. Uh, uh, then I thought, well, we may want to see Xiomara Castro, although I think that Xiomara may be probably, I don't know if I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert on Honduras, but maybe she can be seen as the one that comes to support Mel Zelaya. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's a conduit for Mel Zelaya to be in power. And as we say in Latin America, eh, el poder del tras del trono. Detrás de un gran hombre siempre hay una gran mujer. Behind a great leader, you always find a great woman. But behind, <laughs> not next <laughs> and not ahead, behind. Anyway, machismo puro. Uh, and, but then, you know, the question I had, Caitlin, was uh, it seemed to me that in program, uh, when you have a rational, when you're looking for rational leadership, uh, I, you know, along the lines of the Bavarian uh, description of rational, uh, uh, ras uh, rational leadership and uh, rational legal um, um, theory or, or, or uh, uh, operating principles, the political system, uh, you see that leaders, women are, it is, seems to be easier for them to access power. But when you look at only charismatic settings, it is far more different to, to do it on their own unless they do it through, you know, like Shomara Castro, I may, I may be wrong, this is a question for you through Mel Zelaya. And my question also would be, uh, it, it, do you think that uh, Christina, uh, you know, rose to visibility and to power because of Nestor or, or maybe Nestor became president because Christina had been in politics and very active uh, for many, many, many years. So I don't know, those are some questions very, very, uh, uh, you know, pensando en voz alta, thinking aloud that I want to share, but, uh, but uh, please raise your hands and, and, uh, and come up uh, and participate in this fascinating discussion. So let me, let, let me ask them if you could, uh, you know, comment on, on my, my comments because they're not questions really. In the, whatever order, maybe you, Angela, can start. I think Paolo has a question. Oh, Paolo. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't see you were raising your hand, Paolo. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I want to ask you, to you, Angela. Um, it's very impressive that this discourse against gender ideology is reproducing exactly the same way in Brazil, in Colombia, in Peru, even with the same signs, no? The, the book about gender, about same-sex uh, couples and, and so on. And you told us that this discourse appeared earlier in Latin America than in, in Europe, no? But I keep thinking about the origins of it. Do you believe it's a, it's a question, uh, maybe you don't have the, the uh, uh, an answer, but I want to 
to listen to you about this. Uh, do you believe that it, it's possible to refer to a common original and intentional impulse to it? Or does this, um, this discourse works more than a, a resonance caused by the social networks on, on international potentialities of social networks? And, and the, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm asking to you, there is a conspiracy behind this. <laughs> is, is this the, the truth about my, uh, my question? <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. So, I'll, I'll pass on the question to Angela, yeah. So Paulo, thank you for your question. I think that's a very good question. And I remember a discussion that in a panel before I heard about this, because most of the research about the campaigns against gender ideology and anti-gender campaigns have been conducted in Europe, especially in the east of Europe. So Hungary, Poland, and all of this area. And, and the issue with Latin America, the point with Latin America is that we have this manifestation since the 90s. But the problem with Latin America is that we are so different between countries that it's very difficult like to find one answer that can just point out, this is the reason why we have started first. Actually, this is one of the main questions that is still um, gender researchers still have about these anti-gender campaigns and anti-gender movements, because this is something that is not just happening right now. In the case of Colombia, in 2016, two months before the plebiscite elections was much more visible than before, but it didn't mean that before didn't happen. So we have a very strong uh, Christian evangelical party. It's not the same like in Brazil or in Peru that I, I feel that is completely different and they have much more representation and recognition between public opinion in Colombia is different. And the problem, and, and you mentioned about the social networks, and that's completely the point that is also very difficult to research about that. And it's challenging, especially right now in the, in the era of globalization with social media, what we found in Colombia, in Colombia still then the traditional newspapers are considered like, you know, like public opinion leaders. But in the case of the in the in the case of the elections for the plebiscite, it was the 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 opposite because everything was just happening on the social media, especially in WhatsApp, that is the the most popular the most popular platform in Colombia. But the problem with WhatsApp is that you cannot access like freely to this type of conversations because these groups are restricted to certain persons or if you are just uh, affiliated to this a Christian evangelical church, or if you are, you have this connection with these anti-gender campaigns or this uh, pro-life pro and pro-choice uh, congresses. So the social media has become like the platform where we are trying to get info and to try to understand how they are working there because they are not targeting like the mainstream media because they know as Stephanie mentioned in the paper and also as Diego mentioned, they already are aware and they know that they are not going to pay attention to them. And they are attacking already United Nations, they are attacking also uh, philanthropies. So they know that they are not targeting these places where they are not going to be heard. So that's why they are just doing like a very private campaign. And, and it's very effective. And the problem in Colombia, and in our case, and in Brazil, it was the same with Bolsonaro in 2018 with these digital militias, is because there is a disconnection between the government and between these conversations that the people are having on social media, because you don't know what they are talking about. And the government, they knew in Colombia they were they, they was happening like an anti-gender campaign by they just overestimated and overlooked. They didn't think that people would trust these Christian evangelical leaders, but they forgot about the power of Alejandro Ordóñez and Álvaro Uribe in, uh, in an electoral period. So uh, I don't know if I answer your question, but I think that's like in a very big picture what is happening and why it's so challenging to research about this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have little time left, so I would like to ask a uh, uh, Stephanie and Caitlin to, to make some final comment. Guerreros Digitales, that was a name Correa used for the digital militia. I, I wasn't aware of the digital militia name. 
So you can see this is, you know, come from the right, come from the left. Guerreros digitales. Vamos, mis guerreros digitales. Let's go, my digital militia. Anyway. Okay, just uh, please, I don't know, uh, maybe Caitlin, because you were the, the uh, you, you were the last uh, uh, in speaking, Stephanie, or go ahead, Stephanie. Uh, we, we're all ready to well, listen to your final comments. Well, just just shortly, because I, 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 I'd like to answer as well the, the, the question made by Paolo. Uh, I think that uh, what happened in Latin America is that the, the Catholic Church had an important role in the 90s in developing this, this, uh, this discourse on gender ideology and its problems and so on. Uh, but it really became politicized as such uh, much later in Latin America uh, for exact reasons that we still don't know. Uh, but uh, one key factor is that evangelical actors actually uh, uh, decided to, to build a lot of the work uh, um, on that, um, uh, in, in, and that leads to uh, patterns uh, of even collaboration between the Catholic and, and evangelical churches. Um, and as well, uh, because, you know, the Catholic church, of course, this is not a Latin American church, it's a global church. Uh, it had had some impact in the politics of different European countries. And the, the campaigns that were led there uh, became known in Latin America. So, so it's kind of a different, uh, different events and different dynamics that, that eventually um, uh, caused it, you know, uh, this, this new uh, politics here in Latin America. And all these groups in Latin America are very, very well connected, very well connected, they meet, they, they design joint strategies. Uh, the leader of Con Mis Hijos No Te Metas has traveled all around Latin America, you know, to, to, to sort of uh, bring his good message. <laughs> so, Thank you. Uh, so it's a very transnational movement. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And then finally, Caitlin. Thank you. I'll be really uh, brief, but um, first, like the idea that there's a, a woman behind every man is a, a powerful man is exactly this um, notion of complementarity, I think, that kind of justifies and reinforces the uh, pretty concrete roles of the two. And um, it's also um, kind of in line with the uh, logic of, I, I think, uh, charismatic or populist representation through embodiment and kind of incarnating um, the will of another instead of this kind of uh, liberal outdoing, just kind of um, mandate representation in, in terms of who independent of gender can fulfill my gendered expectations of, of success. Um, and um, I think that Christina is a fascinating case because she does have the background to, in theory, opt for either strategy. Um, she's very skilled and experienced uh, as a political operator herself. Um, and so I think it's what I'm really looking at um, is uh, how she strategically cultivated her own performance and, and portrayed those things. And so I have a lot more work to do on this, but you know, in the work that I've done on my prior work on charisma focused a lot on, on the Kirchner's in Argentina, but um, if she tended to kind of downplay that on the campaign trail and like there's a, a particular quote, um, I'll just share with you kind of cons summing up her campaign performance. It says, in the same way that Evita had managed dual roles as wife of the president and political ambassador, from her husband to the people, Cristina built an image of the dedicated, loyal, and hardworking wife and mother. So she may well have, you know, been a conduit of power for Nestor, but actually presented herself in the reverse. Um, and then indeed was his successor. And, you know, he was governor first and she managed his campaign and he started the law firm and she, so maybe she was running the books and, and the whole operation, but, <laughs> but she, it's how she presented herself and then in turn, and this is a really important part of the project I haven't done yet, um, but how people can conceptualize her legitimacy and power and among her followers 
as well as I think um, uh, peronistas, anti kirchneristas like how they view and why they dispute her legitimacy is, is really interesting and important. So thank you so much for your, your uh, comments and questions. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin. Uh, we look forward to seeing you, you know, your work once you finish. Uh, very eager to read it. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful set of presentations, Caitlin, uh, Stephanie, Angela, and thank you to all the participants. Uh, uh, we have to end this uh, panel now. I like. I will be leaving the workshop because I have another uh, Zoom meeting that I have to attend. Uh, my colleague, Omar Garcia Ponce, uh, also at the Political Science Department and of the Latin American Studies Program, uh, he will be co-hosting the event. I welcome, I noticed Omar is already here. Uh, and I'd like to finally thank you, thank the panelists, thank all the attendants, and a very special thanks to Marlene and to John for, for the wonderful job you have done in putting together this. Wow very, very impressively interesting, thought-provoking, timely and relevant conference. Have a, have a good uh, rest of the day and I'll see you hopefully uh, again soon. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you.